Hi there. Have you ever gotten a note from a director, maybe even a casting director, about something that you were doing, be it on set for maybe a film or a TV series, or maybe you were even on stage for a live performance, and the director told you, you know, I need you to stop doing this, or were you aware that you do this with your face, your head, your hands, your legs, right? And maybe, just maybe, my friend, you've heard this note before. You've heard this note from a completely different production, a completely different director, and yet, oh yeah, someone's told me that before. I know, I do that. Okay, I won't do that. My friend, that's where I come in. So my name is Morgan Risden, and I'm a nationally certified Alexander Technique teacher. And I'm so excited that you're here with me for a one hour introductory workshop on the Alexander Technique. And I'm hoping that you find this a very enriching experience. So just briefly to go over what we're gonna cover today, I'm gonna introduce myself, I'm gonna tell you what is the Alexander Technique and why do actors study it, right? Why are so many acting conservatories and programs including it uh, in their curriculum and in some cases making it mandatory for actors? And then also, what is the history? Like, who discovered this thing? And then I'm gonna go into the more practical things by focusing in on the first principle of Alexander Technique, awareness and observation, and then giving you skills and different exercises that you can try at home. And then when you approach your work, maybe you're doing some self-tapes or auditions or even uh, in, in performance in itself. So I'm hoping that there is a lot of opportunity for learning today and we're gonna wrap up the, um, the workshop with me talking you through constructive rest. So this is an exercise that I'll go more in depth with later, but that is really, I think, very helpful for performers as they're trying to calm down their nervous system and stay more relaxed so that they can allow creativity to flow um, when they're approaching auditions or maybe they're on a set with you know, some important people and you know, anxiety and nerves are really high or maybe just those like lull periods where I'm not working right now and it's really stressful. I just keep submitting the self tapes and hoping for the best or doing the reads and the callbacks, but haven't landed anything. You know, those can also be very stress inducing times for performers and I find constructive rest is really helpful. So I'm gonna be giving you that at the end as well. So as I like to begin all of my introductory workshops, your goal here today is just to learn one thing, that's all. I'm gonna talk a lot, and I'm gonna be giving you hopefully a lot of information, but my hope for you all this afternoon is that you're able just to take away one thing, one piece of learning that really kind of like opens up your mind to the possibility and gets you thinking about yourself and your craft of acting and how you approach it a little bit differently, okay? And so you don't have to know everything I say today, but just one thing really um, sits with you so that you can start to practice and take that into your day-to-day -day life and into your um, acting, okay? So to begin with, who am I? Uh, I said before, my name is Morgan Risden and I'm a nationally certified Alexander Technique teacher. And some of you might be saying, what does that mean? That means after I went to school to get my undergraduate degree, I went for three more years, over 1,600 hours, to be trained to teach people how to use their bodies. And now just to note, my background is in theater. So my undergraduate degree is from ISU and I have a focus of acting. I got my BA in theater. And so I was professionally performing in Chicago for many years before I became an Alexander Technique teacher. And fast forward uh, uh, 10 years now, I've been teaching and doing less acting uh, because this has really been something that brings me a lot of joy and fulfillment in my life. So I'm so excited to share it with you and tell you more. So what is the Alexander Technique, right? And why do people care about it? Well, you know, the Alexander Technique in a little sound bite, I always tell people, is really I teach people how to use their bodies. So how to become more conscious about the habits that you have that are serving you and what kinds of excess tension, stress, tightening do you have that really doesn't help you. It's not serving you. And in some cases as a performer, are actually getting in your way, right? And so Alexander Technique helps to open your eyes to those things and then gives you the skills and the tools that you need to change. 
So for me, my background, as I said, was in acting and my movement teacher was the first one who introduced me to this work. Now, to be honest, friends, I had no idea what was happening. I just knew I had never felt so good in my entire life. And I got really addicted. I was like, whoa, this is so open and so free. And you really felt like you could do anything creatively. You felt like, oh, I've got a lot to access when there wasn't so much tension that you were fighting up against. At least that was my experience. And so for a lot of performers, I find that this is very helpful because when they're approaching characters and such, they're no longer in direct conflict with themselves. They're really out of their way. So I call it neutral, that Alexander Technique teachers help actors become more neutral in their body so that they are free and spacious and open to be more imaginative and creative when approaching their characters. So you're starting from a place of ease and calm, and then you, from there you can really pretty much do anything. So a lot of programs um, offer this and in some cases require it. And it's because, let's face it, as an actor, your body, your voice, everything about you is your livelihood, right? If you cannot perform, you can't make money, right? So more so than other modalities perhaps even, um, I think it's essential that actors are able to keep themselves in good working order, so to speak. And so let me give you an example. So let's say that you're the kind of person who pulls down a lot. You've got poor posture and your shoulders come in and your head's a little forward. We've all seen this. Usually people have like iPhones in their hands when they're sitting like this, right? And let's say that this is kind of how you live for the most part. But then you get cast to play somebody in the military or maybe you're playing um, a boarding uh, woman at a shelter or something and all of a sudden you have to have this really upright held, um, pulled together, tight sort of demeanor about yourself. Well, if you are trying to do this and your habit is down here, the two could be in direct conflict for one another and not really sustainable, meaning that to hold yourself up like this for a long period of time might not even be possible for you. And I'm gonna suggest that especially if you're, let's say you're on Broadway, okay, you've really made it, congratulations, and you have to show up and perform on a regular basis, sometimes even a couple times a day, okay? If you are playing a character that requires so much tension, so much tightness, so much pulling up, you might not be able to continue to do that for very long because your body might fight you. You might experience pain, discomfort, your voice might leave you, and these are all a result of how you are, what we call, using yourself. Okay, so the way that you use yourself in general, head to toe, voice included, is the way we call it use, how you use yourself. And I'm gonna to suggest to you that if you have the skills that I'm gonna be sharing with you, you're gonna be more able to decide, oh, what do I need to be upright to have this sort of demeanor of a woman in charge of an entire house of children or perhaps um, you know, a military person in charge of making very important decisions? Does it have to be with tension? Or is it possible that I could be upright with ease? And I'm gonna be sharing with you today that it could be upright with ease. Okay, so, and let me clarify, I'm gonna interrupt myself real quick because sometimes there is this misunderstanding about posture that Alexander Technique equals good posture. Now, it's kind of like when you exercise, okay? When you exercise, Hopefully, you're not doing it because you want to fit into a size blah, 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 right? You're like, I want to fit into that dress or those jeans. Hopefully, you exercise because it's good for you, because I feel good, my stress is reduced, my blood sugar, uh, blood level goes down, my heart feels better, you know, all these benefits. But oh yeah, I also lose weight, and that can't hurt, right? It's like a side effect, okay? And so posture is a side effect of learning the Alexander Technique. If you are more conscious and more aware of how you use your body, you are going to have better posture because you are now going to notice when you are pulling down in yourself and you're going to realize that's not comfortable. I can't breathe there. You're going to notice when you're cramming your shoulders together because somebody is sitting next to you and you don't really care for them. And instead of pulling in, you might decide to get up or to widen and to scoot a seat over on the train, whatever it is. Okay. And through awareness and observation, you're gonna learn all of these things. So 
let's go to who came up with this, right? The, the history of Alexander Technique. Well, Frederick Matthias Alexander is his name, and we, we call him FM Alexander. And he was an Australian actor, so he was in our world, and he used to perform these wonderful monologues, these Shakespearean monologues. He did all these performances, and he was a young fellow at the time. He was in his 20s, and this is, by the way, over 100 years old, this technique. So it's been around for a long time, even if you're maybe not familiar with it. Um, so it has lasted the test of time. And so this performer, FM Alexander, he would go off and he'd do his performance. Well, all of a sudden then, his voice would leave, right? So he would finish a performance and then he would notice there was hoarseness in his voice and he wasn't able to perform uh, with the same vocal quality or the same projection quality. And so he'd have to inevitably go to his doctor and say, look, what is going on with my voice? Like, why is my voice continuing to leave me? And they'd say, okay, you should go on vocal rest. So go on vocal rest, your voice will come back and we'll take care of it. And so he did that. He followed the doctor's orders and he went on vocal rest. So of course his voice came back, right? His voice came back and he went back to the stage and went back to his performances. But then my friends, his voice left sooner. And interestingly, his voice was gone for longer. So I highlight that because I feel like it's not just that this problem was reoccurring, but be very, very aware that the problem not only returned, but it increased in the severity. So as he was ignoring his body and going on vocal rest and then coming back, it would get upset with him, basically. And it would say, oh, no, 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 you're going back to performance, you're still doing what you're doing, I'm gonna leave and I'm gonna stay for longer so you can't do your job. So you can imagine as a performer how incredibly frustrating, disappointing, and upsetting this could be. So he went to his doctors and he said, look, I think there is something that I myself am physically doing that is causing my voice to leave me. And of course, all the doctors were like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. We totally agree with that. And yeah, we think you're right. So then he was like, okay, so, so what am I doing? What am I doing that's causing this? And then they all scratched their heads and they looked confused and they said, you know, we don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so this man, Frederick Matthias Alexander, did the wonderful work, uh, almost 10 years, my friend, of observing himself. And he developed this technique through awareness, direction, and he came up with this beautiful series of things that we can all benefit from today by basically becoming more aware of the habits that we most of us, I should say, have. And so he went off to continue to teach other teachers how to do this as well as other people. And he became quite famous. Um, he eventually moved to the UK, et cetera, et cetera. And so the story goes. So I think it's important because not just was he an actor, but also he developed this because he was really determined to bring out the best use of himself so that he could show up and do his job, be, you know, be able to perform essentially, right? And so I think for you all, you'll find that, oh, as I'm starting to learn the Alexander Technique and some of the principles that are involved, I find that I'm able to better do my job, which in your case would be performance, right? Okay, so we're gonna get started with the first principle, uh, which is awareness. Awareness and observation, whatever you wanna call it, and I always start with this one in the sense of, can we become aware and open our eyes up and wake up to the things that we do that maybe we're not aware of, that we have no consciousness. It's like sort of below our conscious level. And so the first thing that I'm gonna suggest you do is an exercise I usually do in person, but virtual, we can do this the same. I'm gonna invite you to turn off the video for a moment so that you can do this. But first, I'll explain the exercise. So you're going to take out a sheet of paper with a pen, and you're going to sit comfortably someplace. And I'd like for you to take five minutes, and I want you to jot down what you think about yourself. I want you to jot down who are you, what do you believe about yourself, how do you feel about yourself, all the thoughts that you have about you, whatever they are. And I purposely am sort of vague about this. So if you're scratching your head and you're like, Morgan, what do you mean? Like, I need more instruction. I need, I need more, you know, um, direction with this. No, you don't, friends. You're creative. 
You are an actor. You're like the most creative person I know. So I'm not going to give you any more, uh, any more guidance. I want you just to come up with what your understanding is of those directions. And then I'll see you back here when you finish that. Okay? So hopefully you did that exercise and you've written down a couple of things that you believe about yourself or that you think about yourself. And I want you, I want you to look at those things. I want you to sort of go through the list that you have in front of you and plus or minus, plus or minus. So is it a positive thing or is it a negative thing? Is the thought that I have about myself one that's really good or is it one that's kind of negative? And so just quickly, you know, switch through there and see what comes up. And when you're looking at that, I'm going to ask you how many are positive and negative. I'm going to go out on a limb, friends, because I don't have you directly in front of me. And I'm going to suggest that if not equal, okay, if not equal as many positives as negatives, there's going to be sort of a preference or more of a, a likeliness that you've got more negative. People, we tend to, when we're reflecting on ourselves, we have, it's called like a, a mind bias, and we're, we're biased towards our negative thoughts. And this is something that I think is so relevant for actors because so often we're being judged. We're being put in front of casting directors and we're being put in front of audiences and we're really totally open to criticism and we have to be vulnerable in order to do our craft. And so it can be very difficult. So I'm gonna suggest that the first thing I would like for you all to do is to switch on its head your thinking. How do you approach talking to yourself? What is your mental chatter in your head? The person that we all listen to the most, the conversations that we have most every single day is with ourselves, right? We're always talking to ourselves, oh, I can't believe I forgot that, or oh, I need to do this, did I call my mom, did I da 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 da, right? We're always in our head chatting to ourselves. Well, what if that was a, a more friendly chatter? What if we were talking to ourselves the way we would talk to our best friend, right? We wouldn't be like, oh, I can't believe you ate a whole roll of Thin Mint Girl Scout cookies. No, we'd be like, okay, that was kind of a lot. My best friend would say, you know, uh, yeah, just run an extra mile on the treadmill tomorrow morning, right? Like our best friends are always a little bit more generous and kind. And I'm gonna suggest that you too, my friend, can be a little bit more gentle and kind. Why? because our thinking directly impacts how we feel and how we use our bodies. So if we feel negative and tight and tense, we will show up in the world that way. And again, if we wanna get ourselves to neutral where we can approach any character, any performance we need to do with this open, spacious quality, we're gonna be better off. So now I wanna take the same thought and I want you to do a little exercise where I'm gonna have you take your fist. So I would like for you to make a fist, whatever that looks like for you, right hand, left hand, just make a fist. You're gonna hold it up and make a fist. Now, I would like for you to pretend that you're holding my five-year-old's butterfly in your fist. So did your fist change? <laughs> Thinking about holding a delicate, fragile butterfly, did your wrist or your fingers or your palm? Did anything about the shape of your fist alter or change at all? And again, I'm gonna go out on a limb and I'm gonna assume yes, it probably did. Why? Why is that? And why does it matter, Morgan? Who cares? Well, why did it happen? Because so often we are told an instruction. I'd like you to stand up. I'd like you to sit down. And we do it. We're like, okay, autopilot, autopilot, do it, do it, do it. And we never stop to think, oh, how am I gonna do that? So I said make a fist. That's just bring your fingers in towards your palm and shut your hand together so that you could keep something in your hand. Fist does not have to be something that is tight or tense. And if your default, my friend, is always that with tension, is always that with tightness and strain and stress, that is gonna show up not just in your fist, but in everything you do. So as Alexander Technique teachers, we're always looking at the body as how am I doing something? Not what am I doing, but how am I doing it? How am I picking up my glass of water? How am I putting on my glasses? How am I holding my steering wheel? Or how am I walking? We're looking at the how do we do things instead of just the what that we're doing. 
okay? And this is very important, again, because when you stop to be more aware and conscious, then you have choices. Because you all know that as a performer, you're always trying to change the way that you're walking, change the way that you're carrying your body on stage or on set. You're trying to really embody a character, somebody else that is not you. How are you going to do that? Are you going to do that with open creativity or are you going to do that with a pulling in, a tightening and something where you're always having to strain to achieve it? I'm going to suggest that the easier way is to do it with ease and freedom, right? So some simple things that we start off with is just like anatomy, right? We look at, do you know anything about your body? So I'm going to ask you, where is the top of your spine? And you might be like, oh, I don't know. I've never thought about it. Great. Now is a good time to think about it, friends. And I'd like for you, even though I can't see you, I'd like for you to move your hands where you think. Like kind of touch your body and feel like where, where do we move from? Where do we move from? Okay, where's the top of my spine? You might be surprised to find and to learn that the top of your spine is in between your ears behind the bridge of your nose. So it's like way up here. That's really pretty far. It's like way up here. Again, in between the ears, behind the bridge of your nose. And why is that important? That's where your head moves from. So there are four major weight-bearing joints. That's the head and the spine. You wanna guess where any of the other ones are? I mean, <clears throat> I can't hear you, but you can go ahead and just in your mind's eye, like think about it and be like, hmm, yeah. Okay, so what would be the head and the neck? The other one is going to be your hips. The other one is your knees. And then the last one is going to be your what? Yeah, your ankles, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So we have your head and your neck, your hips, your knees, and your ankles. And these are weight bearing because they bear your weight. Oftentimes, people like to imagine that their vertebrae, their spine, someplace in there is supporting them or acting as a weight bearing joint. And it's not. You've got joints in there, okay, that allows you to move and like reach for things and stretch, etc but they're not supposed to be holding your physical body's weight repetitively, okay? And this is important, why? Because again, when you think about this idea, people call it grounding or being present. If you don't know where your weight is being distributed through your body, you're always kind of searching for it, right? So let's just kind of, let's stand up for a moment because it's always nice to stand up, right? So we're gonna stand up for a moment and I want you to think about, okay, where are my hips? And I'm gonna have you put your hands on your hips. And I'm assuming most of y'all have put your hands somewhere like here, right? Hands on hips. This is like Rocky Horror Picture Show, hands on, on uh, hips, they always say. Uh, no, your hips are actually in towards your um, groin, towards your pelvis. And you can feel if you kind of like move from there or if you like pick up your leg, you can feel, oh, the movement actually happens inside my center of gravity versus outside on my side of my body. And again, this is important because if you think that you move from out here, you will try to move from out here versus if you know that you move here, you're going to start walking, oh, like I move here, which is going to make a difference. You'll see. Now I would like for you to try shifting your weight from one side to the other. And you know, if you're in line at the grocery store, maybe you're at the post office, whatever, there's like a hip you prefer, right? Kind of, I don't know, whichever side it is, kind of sink in to whatever hip that is for you. And I always tease people, I say, that's the hip that's gonna need the replacement first because you're not intended to put all of your weight on just one side of your, your body. Your weight is really meant to be equally distributed. So this is very important because again, if you're moving your body from a place where uh, you don't have a sense of where things are or what things move, there's gonna be confusion in your body about what is supporting you and holding you up. A lot of times people will use their shoulders, their rib cage, their uh, backs, lower back, upper back, mid back, all of it. There's no bias, people use all parts of their backs. And they will use those different areas to support them when they're in upright, be it sitting or standing, projecting, singing, acting. And really, that will interrupt and interfere with your ability 
to be more free and more mobile when you're in performance mode. And so we always begin with a little bit of anatomy and a better understanding. Again, this is an intro, guys, so I'm not going to go into all of the uh, nooks and crannies about this, but I do want to get you thinking about, oh, I've never thought about my body before, and like, why do we even care about our bodies? And let's ask that, like, why? Why do we care about our bodies? Well, because so much is said through our, our bodies, so much is communicated, right? I'm actually going to give you um, a statistic. So studies show that only 7% of what you say to people actually comes through via what you're actually saying. So right now I'm talking to you and I'm using language and I'm not using like a teleprompter or anything. It's like improv, right? I'm just teaching. But 7% of what I'm saying is what you are receiving and taking in as a part of that exchange of communication, right? Because we know Hopefully we all know that communication is two ways, right? It's what is being said and then what is being received. So only 7% of what I'm telling you is actually being received as communication. Well, what about the other 93%? Okay, it's broken up as follows. 38% is your vocal inflection, is your tone of voice, your pace, the energy that comes through your voice. That's 38% friends. That leaves 55 to body language. 55% of what you say, your facial expressions, your hand gestures, your demeanor, your posture, your presence is communicated via, via your body. It's like a lot. I always like to tease actors. I'm like, oh, good news. You have to memorize, but it doesn't matter that much, right? I mean, I joke. But it's, again, this understanding of the body should not be underestimated when we're approaching roles, nor should the voice or the text, right? It's really about the entire character development. And when you as a performer have a better understanding of, oh, what do I do? Like, what do I, so in my case, be what do I, Morgan, do every day? Do I twist my hair with my fingers when I'm bored? Do I bite my nails? Do I um, pick my nails? Do I shake my legs? Some people have this like shaking leg thing. Or do I tilt my head up when I think? Um, someone asks me a question and I tilt my head up to consider it, right? What do I do? Because then you can start to say, you know what, do I have to do that? Somebody's just asked me a question and instead of tilting my head, I want to, I'm not going to, okay. That is Alexander technique. That's what he discovered. He found that when we went to go do something, we had an immediate response that lacked any sort of awareness or consciousness. And he said, well, if I just start to pay attention to those things, I can get my voice back in good working order, which is what he did, right? And so this kind of awareness to what habits you have can really serve you as a performer because now you have the ability to say like, oh, I'm gonna choose what my character does. I'm gonna be conscious about how I reach for something or about how I scratch my head, right? If I'm a, a playing a, the Queen of England, I might be a little bit more um, subtle with how I hold my hands or how I, I scratch versus if I'm somebody, you know, um, who's in a poverty uh, income, who, you know, maybe is working uh, two jobs or something like that and raising four kids. Like that person might be scratching a totally different way, right? So taking those things into consideration and really allowing your characters to become more three-dimensional. That's, I think, what's so exciting is that then you have all of this um, energy to really put into consciousness, how do I want to show up as this character that I'm playing? and you're gonna stand out from the other people in their self tapes, in their auditions, in their performances, because there's gonna be something. It's not in the text, because everybody is saying the same text, the same 7% is being received. It might not be in the vocal, the vocal area, because okay, I can hear you, yeah, your pace is a little bit similar to so-and-so who's just here, but like, what makes you more interesting than the next person? or the last person. What about you? Oh, it's because you've decided to really embody your character, right? You're making conscious choices that maybe the other people are not making. And it's not because you're so self-conscious, but it's because your body is free of tension and the creativity, my friend, is gonna flow 
it will flow through you because now you don't have so many obstacles with who you are showing up in every single one of your characters, right? So this is very important, I think, for us as performers to kind of wrap our head around. And I'm gonna give you some homework. And I want you to practice your observation skills. And I want you to go out into the world um, and I want you to observe. And maybe that's, maybe that's even just online when you're watching movies or TVs. I mean, you don't necessarily have to be in a grocery store to observe people. But when you're watching something or when you're looking at somebody, or maybe you're observing a family member, what do they do? What are their mannerisms? What are the ways that they work, so to speak? And what about those things makes you believe certain things about them? So in other words, what is being communicated to you even though they're not saying it? So let me give you a couple of examples. So perhaps you've had a friend who comes in and is like, hey, and you start talking, and they're talking about other stuff, but you can tell there's an energy about them. There's something going on. They're not telling you anything, but they're just a little like more frantic, more like out of breath and kind of like all over the place. And you might say like, what's wrong? Right? We've all had a friend like that, been like, well, dude, what's up? What's going on? Is everything okay? And then you, you realize, oh yeah, you know, my mom is in the hospital again, or I just heard that my parents, you know, flight got delayed and they were having to blah, 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 whatever. Okay. We pick up on that stuff because they're not saying it, but we're not stupid because their bodies are communicating to us. That, my friend, is what I'm telling you the Alexander Technique is going to allow you to do. Because you're going to start to notice, oh, I see. I see. There's something more to this character. Sometimes we read a script as actors and it's like the most obvious things jump out, right? It's like, oh, or even sometimes the playwright will just like tell you. <laughs> It'll like be like right there on the script for you. But what about all these other things that make those characters so interesting? And what makes it so interesting for audiences to watch and for people to believe? So I always tell my actors in my classes and in my, in my private lessons, I always tell them that I think actors are at their best when it feels like you're sitting on you know, the train in New York and you're you know, like kind, of, kind of observing and like just people watching, right? When you're sort of like a voyeur and you're witnessing a real event. Because we've all seen it. We've seen the couple at the restaurant that we know, like, whoa, they're in a fight. I don't know what they're in a fight about because we can't hear, but, like, their body language tells us something ain't right and, like, ooh, like, he's in the doghouse or she's in the doghouse, right? Like, we know just based on body language. And what if you have the ability to be able to always access how you felt based on the words and the text and the fact that your body was not interrupting those impulses? those natural, creative impulses that you have worked, I'm sure, so hard to cultivate in your acting training and so hard to refine. And that's what this work really allows you to do. So to move on, I'm going to suggest that we start to explore this concept of constructive rest. So I'm going to be moving over to the table in a few moments and I'm gonna show you exactly what I'm talking about and then I will come back to the camera and I will talk you through uh, the whole exercise. So just to start, I always suggest to people um, to have some books under their head. So oftentimes people will want to get like a pillow. That's sleeping, okay? <laughs> you want to be not on your bed, not on a couch, lying down, ready for slumber, but you want to be on a yoga mat or on the carpet or a rug on the floor, and you want to have some books. So I always tell people, like, these are my books that I use, um, and you can see that they're kind of like different different um, heights. They're like, you know, not all one. So don't get, Le you know, Leo Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. Okay, folks? Like, get your playbills out or your magazine, something that you can easily adjust the height if you feel like it's too many or too few books. Okay? So I want you to be able to have this uh, accessible for your head to, to be on. And then also, I use some bolsters like so. For my um, students, I use them under their uh, ankles or under their knees. So you can do the same, different heights. Maybe you don't have this, but you could have a, um, a pillow. You could have maybe a meditation cushion, or you could have like a blanket rolled up, a towel, what have you, if that's more comfortable. Oh, and you know what, just as a side note, if you ever experience extreme back pain, or problems, always put your knees, and I'll show you this um, in the video when I do constructive rest, you can put your knees up at like 90 degrees like this. 
so that you really allow yourself um, to have support so that your lower back can release. And the ideal time is like, I don't know, maybe 10 to 15 minutes of constructive rest. So you're gonna go ahead and you're going to give yourself ample time, be it in the morning or at night, whenever you feel like you can um, make time for it and set yourself up in a quiet space, no distractions, no podcasts or um, you know uh, TV shows or anything on in the background, no music. This is constructive rest because you are constructively focusing on your body. So I always tell people that it's very often that we don't really consider our bodies, right? In fact, when I teach group classes, I'll ask people like, when do you think about your body? And usually people are like, yeah, when it hurts, when I exercise, you know, sometimes people will say pleasure, but like most often it's like, when I feel like I ate too many cookies or, you know, it's like, we have very specific times when we're thinking about our body. And I'm suggesting that this constructive rest is an opportunity for you to solely focus on your body and hear how it's feeling and how it's doing. So you're opening up a space in your day-to-day -day life for your body to start talking to you, right? So when we experience pain, sometimes people will realize like, oh, I've been uncomfortable for a while, but like my body had to get really loud and had to hurt a lot before I noticed it. You know, when you start to quiet down your chatter and you focus on your breathing and focus on your body, usually people find like they can, they can discover areas of tension that are starting to creep up that they're like, oh, I think I should have gotten up a little bit more often throughout the day. I was sitting too long at my desk or I'm not really, I wasn't really comfortable when I was watching that movie earlier. And your body actually will start to communicate you, communicate with you when you do this constructive rest more often. So I'm just gonna suggest to you that uh, you really give yourself an opportunity to stay awake, keep your eyes open, and then go ahead and um, do constructive rest in a quiet space where you can give your body an opportunity to re-energize. So I'm gonna allow you an opportunity, you can turn the video off, and you can go and find a quiet space in your home where you can lie down and get yourself set up, get your books, and, um, and get, your, uh, get your bolsters if you need anything for under your knees or your ankles to support you, okay? So now you'll find yourself in constructive rest and I'm demonstrating for you what that looks like. So again, I've got the books underneath my head and oftentimes people are always asking me, how many books do I need? Friend, you just don't want your head flat on the floor. So I'm gonna show you if I take the books, and you can do this at home. If you take the books and then you put your head, I mean, you can actually kind of even hear it in my voice. It strains the back of your neck and it puts a lot of pressure on the neck to hold the head up. So we're just allowing the neck muscles to relax so that it doesn't have to hold the weight of the head up. Let's face it, the neck already does that all day, friends. So here you are, and again, you're in a quiet space of your home. You're lying down flat, perhaps on a rug, a yoga mat, and your head is balancing on the books. You're gonna feel free to adjust accordingly as I'm talking you through constructive rest because I'm not your body. I don't know exactly what you need in any given moment. So it's really up to you to be able to adjust accordingly. If you need to scooch up at your spine or if you need to take a book out or put a book in. And again, if you have extreme lower back problems or your back, your lower back is giving you a lot of um, issues, you can go ahead and you can put your legs up on like you know, a chair or an ottoman, the edge of a bed or something like that. And this sort of support when your calves are being held up by something else, it's really gonna hold your body up um, in a way that allows your lower back to relax. So feel free to do that as well, if and when you need that. So to begin with, I'm just going to invite you to let your breath out on whatever air you have already in you and it'll sound sort of like So we call it a whispered ah, it's the ah as in father. So just again, letting out the air. You don't have to take an inhale, 
You're just focusing on your exhale. Lips will close and air is going to come in through your nose. Filling up your ribs on either side. And again, you're going to try to keep your eyes open. It can be very, very, um, it can be very exciting to close your eyes, especially when you're feeling more relaxed. But the goal here, friend, is to allow yourself an opportunity to listen to your body. So you want to be awake for that and alert. So we're first going to take a scan of our whole body from head to toe. You're going to trace in your mind's eye all the different parts of your body and see how they're feeling. Where am I experiencing tension? Where am I experiencing ease? What parts of my body are perhaps holding or tightening? And where can I let that go? So every chance you get when you notice any sort of tension, see if you can just sort of wash over it with your awareness. You can experience it and you can see it in your mind's eye, but you're not going to linger there so that it's distracting you from the overall experience. You're going to try to keep your eyes up so that the gaze is up towards the ceiling. Oftentimes people will want to gaze down this way because even our eye muscles have habits. So eyes tend to want to go down when they're laying uh, in this horizontal position, but see if you can keep them really all the way up on the ceiling. And then allow yourself to soften into the earth underneath you. Letting your head rest on the books and the neck muscles relax. You're going to soften your face muscles, so any tension or any strain that you have around your eyes, your brows, your sinuses, you're going to allow all of that to soften. You can allow yourself to swallow Relaxing both the jaw, the lips, and even the tongue. Your tongue is resting on the bottom of your mouth, touching the very bottom of your teeth, and it's wide in the back. I like to put my hands on my torso, on my belly, or my ribs, but you could also have your hands out to the side if you'd like, but just somewhere so that they're relaxed. In your mind's eye, you can go all the way down to your shoulder blades and imagine your shoulder blades sinking in to the ground. They're going to relax away from the sky, away from your collarbones. And imagine yourself widening from right to left. You have space in your ribs, underneath your armpits, and even all the way down in your mind's eye to your pelvic floor for your breathing to expand and contract. Oftentimes I imagine the breath is like waves the ocean that come into the shore. So with each breath, it's changing. It's never the same, never repetitive. The strength varies, the height varies, the intensity varies. You're just continuing to allow the flow of your breath to influence the state of calm that your mind and your body is experiencing. And then if you can, picture in your mind's eye the length of your spine. As we talked about before, the top of your spine is in between your ears, behind the bridge of your nose. And it goes all the way down to your tailbone. So it's long, it's relaxed, 
And you can let the weight of the vertebrae fall into the earth. Again, notice your shoulders if they're pulling up or in and see if you can just invite them to relax and release. Thinking about the space from your shoulder to your elbow and the length between the elbow and your wrists. Your palms are easy and open and your fingers are not clenched together, but rather wide and expansive. Inviting energy to flow out through your fingertips, lengthening throughout your whole arm. Notice your rib cage. Imagine that it doesn't just expand and contract going up and down, but also going from right to left. And you can even think internally. It's a three-dimensional breathing apparatus, so you can imagine all of that space in between your ribs expanding to make way for your free breath. Again, on your next exhale, you're gonna let out a breath. Lips will close, air is gonna come in through the nose filling all the way up to your armpits. And then out again. Let your mind be easy. And let your thoughts wash through you. You're going to travel down in your mind's eye to your pelvis, imagining it widening from right to left, and letting the tailbone really hang far away from the top of your spine. Let your thigh bones relax into the bolsters that's holding them up. So that all of the muscles can release. So it's not just the tops of your thigh muscles or even the backs, but again, you're going to think in from your pelvis and your groin all the way down to your knees and then even the outside, the outside part of your thigh is also lengthening away from your pelvis. Your torso is relaxed. Your head again is resting on the books. And from here, you're going to travel down your calves. Imagining a soft space at the knee that unlocks the, the long lower legs. The muscles can sort of fall off in your mind's eye of the bones. And you're really letting all of those major joints have space and freedom to relax. In your mind's eye, you're gonna to travel to your ankle joint. Imagining that there's room and air and space, free of any tension or any strain. And then your feet. Hopefully you're wearing either socks or you've got bare feet. But in your, in your mind's eye, you really want to picture your entire foot having the space for your 26 bones. Oftentimes we'll put our feet into a sock, into a shoe, call it a foot. But there are 26 bones hundreds of tendons and ligaments all in your feet. A very delicate contraption that allows you not only to balance when you're in an upright, but also to move. 
and to be free. As an actor, it's especially important because this is going to allow you the potential to feel grounded when you're in performance mode. You're not going to be pulling up from Mother Earth, but rather you're rooted and suspended from the ground. So picture that heel bone releasing away from your ankle joint and your knee joint. And get a sense of how wide your foot is from right to left. You've got space from either side of your balls of your toes. And you can even wiggle around your toes to get the energy flowing so that you really get a sense of the blood circulating through your whole body. When you're ready, you're going to let out the, another whisper of an ah. Lips are going to close. Air is going to come in through the nostrils. If your eyes have closed, See if you can open them, even if only for temporary, temporarily just one moment, and then you can close them again if it's too much work. And then I'm going to give you one moment just to be still with your own thoughts, to make way for your body to communicate with you what it needs in this moment. And as you prepare yourself to get up from constructive rest into horizontal, give yourself permission to take the time that you need to adjust into upright. Oftentimes we are so quick to change what we're doing or where we're at. We're in a very, a very quick paced society. So give yourself permission to take some time. I'm going to get myself off the table, and then go ahead and wrap up the session for today. But if you need to, give yourself permission to stay here a little bit longer. Hi there, friends. So hopefully you enjoyed your experience with constructive rest this afternoon, and Hopefully you were able to find yourself in a calmer state than when you began. I like to tell people that I know at the beginning sometimes it can feel like oh, I wanted to fall asleep or I was really close to drifting off into slumber. This is very common. Um, I think that especially for many people, we really associate relaxation and calm with sleep. And so to start becoming more calm and easy in our body when we are alert and really present can feel kind of bizarre and in some cases not even possible at the beginning. So you want to really practice this constructive rest as often as possible so that you get more comfortable and your body gets more familiar with this state of relaxation and calm because obviously the more you practice something, friends, the better you're going to be at it. So I always recommend to my students that you do something like this um, at least you know every day for 10 minutes. Um, and especially at the beginning, I find that if you can do it consecutively for like say seven to 10 days, you'll really be able to see a shift in your body. So you'll be able to notice like, oh, I feel a little freer, a little calmer, a little easier. And the more you do it, the more you're gonna experience those things. Uh, sometimes students will say like, Morgan, I just don't have 10 minutes. I don't have that time. Okay, your body doesn't care. Two minutes, like lay down and don't fall asleep. Give your body two minutes, right? It's with us all the time. Uh, so definitely to afford just two or three minutes is not going to hopefully uh, put you out too much. So whatever you can give, your body is going to be grateful for, I promise. But hopefully as um, we're wrapping up today, you remember all of the homework that we talked about, these skills of observation that I would love for you to exercise in your day-to-day -day life. So first it will be for observing other people, what are other people doing and how are they carrying themselves. 
And what do I think about them based on what I'm seeing? Their gestures, their facial expressions, their body language or demeanor, like what about that use of themselves is making me believe certain things about them, right? And then the second part to that would be, can you start to observe yourself? So can you start to pay attention and sort of turn the mirror onto yourself to see what is it that I do? What am I doing in my day-to-day -day life? Am I, um, am I having habits that kind of frequently come up, right? For some of us, we have habits like, um, you know, doing this or that, and we don't necessarily know about it, we're not conscious until someone calls us out on it. Well, now is your opportunity, friend, for you to discover what it is that you do, and then see if you can start to shift and change those things, right? And sometimes it's like hard because we're like, oh, I do that, I do that. We've all had habits, right? Some people, oh, used to have a habit of smoking, but like, oh, I'm not a smoker anymore. Some people, oh, I bite my nails or I bought, you know, I used to bite my nails all the time, but I don't do it anymore, you know? So we give up those habits and it's no longer part of our identity or part of our behaviors. And somehow we're still here to live and tell about it. So I'm gonna suggest the same thing goes for other habits that might be a little bit more unconscious and below your level of awareness at this point in time. And then as you start to play around with this, can you stay open and curious? So oftentimes I will tell my students to leave judgment at the door, or um, as I like to say, like let other people be the judge of that because everyone else is judging, so we don't need to. Um, so try to see if you can leave the good, the bad, the right, the wrong um, to the side to really allow this work to be fun so that you're curious and open-minded and you really want to explore what you're doing versus judging because nobody wants to feel like oh, I did that again. I wish I stopped shaking my leg uncontrollably. If you notice with some curiosity and like wonder, you'll be like, oh, that's so funny. And like I was doing that a minute ago and I stopped it and I'm doing it again. Right. And then you can start to understand how those kinds of habits, those kinds of behaviors might be showing up in your characters and in your roles. So, again, I hope that you got a lot from today. I gave you a lot of information, and again, if you'll remember from the beginning, the only thing I asked for you is to walk away with one thing. So one thought that really kind of struck you and got you questioning things, and can you take that and sort of digest it and consider it? Because that's when the learning takes place. Okay, friends, so there are tons of resources out there for you at your disposal. Alexander Technique, there's websites. Um, and so feel free to reach out and to ask more questions. Otherwise, until next time, my friends, take care. Ciao.